So I'm going to um, talk to you now about some of the new books that were published today. I'm going to focus on nonfiction. I'm not going to use a PowerPoint tonight because I want to be able to see all of your beautiful faces, but I will follow up our meeting by sending you a list of titles. So I will make sure you get that information. Now, last week, we talked about a towering literary figure from a previous era. We talked about Susan Sontag. Now I'm going to talk about another longtime literary figure, and that is Joan Didion. Mm -hmm. Like Sontag, Didion also in part achieved her acclaim in her writing from writing essays and journalism. Here's something that USA Today said about Joan Didion. The tide of new journalism that flooded the late 1960s and 70s may have been dominated by the exclamation marks, manic italics, and machismo of Tom Wolfe, Norman Mailer, or Hunter S. Thompson, but the lower key voice of Joan Didion has outlasted and outperformed those swaggering peers. Didion's the American icon who would declare in her most famous sentence, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. And Time Magazine says, Didion will forever be a certain type of person's idea of a deity, the literary, the cool. She is a chronicler of our world, a writer who dissolves shared delusions to present cold reality with style. Any Joan Didion fans out there? Didion launched her career in the, writing about the 1960s counterculture as well as about California life. She grew up in California. She published her first novel in 1963. Her first published work of nonfiction came out in 1968, and that is the collection Slouching Toward Bethlehem, followed by the novel Play It As It Lays in 1970. In 1964, she married John Gregory Dunn, which led to a very long, loving, partnership that was also a writing partnership. They adopted a daughter whom they named Quintana Roo, and they said they picked that name because it's the name of a Mexican town and they saw it on a map and they liked it. Now Didion came, for, for those uh, people who became her fans back with her early writing in the 60s and 70s, I think she got a whole new crop of fans in 2005 when she published her memoir, The Year of Magical Thinking. Right, I see people shaking their heads. Yes. And this is a book that she wrote in response to the terrible experience of her husband dropping dead at the dinner table in front of her at a, a, as a result of a heart attack. Um, and if you've read it, it's a beautiful memoir, powerful, sad. Um, and at the time, her daughter also became sick and she died the next year. She wrote another memoir about that. So today, Joan Didion has a new book. It's called let me tell you what I mean. And I think it's a very simple cover, as you can see, just a type treatment. Um, and to me, I think what they're doing here is echoing the look of the year of magical thinking, because I think that's a book that maybe a majority of readers are going to know her for. So this is a collection of essays going back to 1968 um, and then up into the future. And they tackle a number of topics. Um, she writes about newspapers, where she says, the problem is not so much whether one trusts the news as to whether one finds it. She writes about not getting into Stanford, which was her dream school. She writes something called Why I Write, where she ponders the act of writing. And she says, I write entirely to find out what I'm thinking, what I'm looking at, what I see, and what it means. Isn't that beautiful? I like that. She admires Hemingway's sentences. She admires Martha Stewart's story and says that it has historically encouraged women in this country, even as it has threatened men. So that's the new book from Joan Didion. Um, Kathy, thank you for your comment and the link to the New York Times piece. Okay, now on to another topic, and that topic is climate change. So climate change is going to be um, part of our politics and in the news more and more. Um, I 
have probably talked to some of you about a novel I read not that long ago called Migrations by Charlotte McConaughey. And that is uh, what is called climate fiction. So we have a whole new genre. That's a story where all the, it's set a little bit in the future and all the animals have died except for the Arctic terns and our, our uh, main character is following their migration. Um, I love that book. But today we have some nonfiction and it is this book, How to Prepare for Climate Change. And the subtitle is A Practical Guide to Surviving the Chaos. So David, that's it. David Pogue? David Pogue. Okay. Okay. David Pogue, excuse me. He was the New York Times um, weekly technology columnist from 2000 to 2013. He's an Emmy Award winner for his stories on CBS News Sunday Morning, um, a five-time TED speaker, a host of Nova Science specials on PBS, and he has written or co-written more than 120 books. The first thing that I noticed about this book, which you can't tell from where you are, is that the cover is like plasticky. It's a new book, but it's in paperback. Most new books come out in hardcover because that gets them more review attention. So it's got this like survivalist feeling with this plastic cover. Um, the book offers sensible, deeply researched advice for what we should start to get ourselves ready for in the years ahead. Pogue walks readers through what to grow, what to eat, how to build, how to ensure, where to invest, and how to prepare your children and pets, and even where to relocate when the time comes. It's a really frightening book. So here are some of the titles, uh, chapter titles. Um, protecting your children, ready for anything, preparing for flood, preparing for heat waves, preparing for drought, preparing for hurricanes and tornadoes, preparing for wildfires, preparing for mosquitoes and ticks, preparing for social breakdown. Sound good? Want to run out and get that one to cheer you up? Okay, so that is David Polk. Our next book, it's probably not going to cheer you up either. It is called American Compromat. And if I could do a good Russian accent, I would say the title with that. American Compromat, How the KGB Cultivated Donald Trump and Related Tales of Sex, Greed, Power, and Treachery. The author of this book is Craig Unger with very good credentials. He's written six other books, um, several New York Times bestsellers, all about um, political issues. For 15 years, he was a contributing editor for Vanity Fair, where he covered national security and the Middle East. He's a frequent analyst on MSNBC. He was a staffer at New York Magazine, et cetera, et cetera. He graduated from Harvard. So here is what this book is about. Based on extensive exclusive interviews with dozens of high level sources, Soviets who resigned from the KGB and moved to the United States, former CIA officers, FBI agents, lawyers at Washington firms, and an analysis of thousands of pages of FBI and police investigations and news articles in English, Russian, and Ukrainian. This book shows that something much more sinister and important has been taking place than the public could ever imagine, namely, that from Donald Trump to Jeffrey Epstein, Compromat operations documented the darkest secrets of the most powerful people in the world and transformed them into potent weapons. See, I told you this was another scary book. Was Donald Trump a Russian asset? Just how compromised was he? And how could such an audacious feat have been accomplished? So you get the idea, and I think this is for a very specific type of reader. You will, you will know if this is your kind of book. Um, I, did, I do have to point out in reading about the book uh, that the publisher says, Craig Unger reports on operations that amassed compromising information on the richest and most powerful men on earth. And I read that and I couldn't help but notice that it said men. And I had to wonder, does this mean that women are not powerful enough for our enemies to try to compromise us or that we are impervious to such tactics? So that is that book. Now the next is a book by Simon Winchester. Has anyone read Simon Winchester? He's the author of The Professor and the Madman. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. 
Yes. Yep. Very popular book. So he has a new book out um, and it is called Land. This one actually came out last week, but I'm sneaking it in for you today. How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World. Nice thick book, cat categorized in world history. So it says, with his unique blend of wide-eyed curiosity, meticulous research, and erudite analysis, Winchester re weaves a tapestry that encompasses nearly every element involved with the concept of land and demonstrates that land and ownership have indeed shaped the modern world. And critics say that that's a sort of, you know, exaggerated conceit that a lot of writers claim that like, oh, this is the theme that shaped the modern world. But Winchester, they feel like really makes a good case for it. Um, so that is that. And now we have a new book by Charles Glow. The Devil You Know, A Black Power Manifesto. So that also was just published today. Now he is, you may read his work in the New York Times. He's a very distinguished columnist there. And this book is his daring plan to advance black civil rights. The devil that black Americans know all too well is racism. And as Blow notes from the outset, it is not confined to, this, confined to the South. And this is a quote from him. Black people fled the horrors of the racist South for so-called liberal cities of the North and West, trading the devil they knew for the devil they didn't, only to come to the painful realization that the devil is the devil. And of course, those of you who have read um, Isabel Wilkerson, um, the warmth of other sons will have read about the migration. Blow proposes a radical path toward black empowerment in this impassioned call for as many black descendants of the great migration as possible to return to the South with moral and political intentionality. This mass resettlement, Blow argues, would allow African Americans to colonize and control the states they would have controlled if they had not fled them. Um, I've read a number of reviews, again, as I say, because these books are new, I haven't had a chance to read the books yet. Um, one review says, Blow, though Blow's provocative call for action contains much food for thought, readers will wish for a more realistic way forward. Uh, but another review says, valuable as a thought experiment alone, but also an actual plan for effecting lasting political change. So there are reviews on both sides, but either way, I think it is certain to become another important book in our ongoing and essential national conversation about systemic racism in our society and how to eradicate it. The next book I have to show you is a memoir by Cicely Tyson. This is in the paper. I was in the paper this weekend. Was it? Yeah. So um, she is, I think, 96 now, and she is sharing her life story. Um, she has had a long and distinguished career and has shown great determination, has become an iconic cultural figure. When President Obama presented her with the Presidential Medal of Honor in 2016, he said, in her long and extraordinary career, Cicely Tyson has not only succeeded as an actor, she has shaped the course of history. And she sat next to my mother on an airplane once. Wow. My mother fell in love with her. Um, Is that so, in her autobiography? Did she put it in, in my mother's autobiography? Or no, it's Cicely Tyson. <laughs> I'm sure it's in there. It's at least a footnote. <laughs> nice woman on plane. Funny Boston accent. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this book, before I even open it, is the cover photo. This is a very, um, uh, taken by the photographer Lord Snowden in the 1970s. So this is a very famous photo um, and it's what she chose to, to represent her. That isn't her, is it? Yes. Oh, it is her. Yeah. 
That was a remarkable photo. Lord Snowden was the husband of Princess Margaret, I think. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I was just thinking that from the crown. <laughs> yep. Yep. So there you go. He became good friends with Cicely Tyson after he took this photograph. I don't know if that's in the show. I don't know if she's in it. So that is what I have for you tonight. I would love to hear any questions or comments. Does anyone have any? I want to know how you get an understanding of these books. How, do you ever complete them or you just start them? How do you, do um, you read entire books or you just read parts of books? Both. I, mean, I read as much as I can. Um, you know, uh, I mean, sometimes I don't have time to read the whole book. So I read the first few chapters. I read a lot of reviews. Um, I have my trusted review sources. And I talk to people in the bookstore about what they think. I guess I've gotten pretty good at reading the clues and I can tell. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I wish I could sit and read them all. In fact, it's interesting that you say that because I just finished a book. And so I'm in that exciting moment where I get to decide what to read next. Of course, I tend to get a little bit paralyzed at that point because I give myself too many choices. So I was going to read, while well, I started, I read the first few pages of The Liar's Dictionary. I think I showed you that book. That's the one with the, the peacock with the leaves of the book as the peacock's tail. Um, and that's a book that was described as being for word geeks. So I kind of figured I had to read that one. Um, and then there's this book, The Divines by Ellie Eaton, which I talked to you about last week, which is about the woman who goes back to the fancy boarding school that she she went to um, and digs up some old dirt. That one sounded kind of fun too. Um, and then this is a book that I'm planning on reading tomorrow because I couldn't resist. Uh, I do these video story times for Barnes and Noble that we post on our Instagram page. So tomorrow I will be doing story time with Avocado Asks. If you like, I could read it to you now. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the reasons I love children's picture books so much is because I can sit down and read a whole book in one sitting. Yeah. And they're cute. And they're very self-empowering. Donna? Um, so I, I always read the New York Times book review every Sunday. And <laughs> in, the, in the back where they have the charts, they have trade paperbacks yes. and they have other paperbacks. I, I've always wondered what the difference is. Yes. Excuse me. Um, it's freezing in my house. Um, the difference between trade paperbacks and what are called mass market paperbacks, mm -hmm. um, first of all, are the size. The trade paperback is, well, it's hard for you to tell because it's nothing to um, comparing it to. But usually they're about five by eight, roughly that size. They generally tend to cost between 16 and $18. And mass market paperbacks are the little ones like pocketbooks. And the reason that they're called that is because of where they're distributed. So um, trade paperbacks and hardcovers are distributed through the trade, meaning they go to bookstores. Whereas mass markets are often sold in drugstores and other outlets. So that is why that distinction was originally made because the books were sold in different places. And it's really not a category that's meaningful to people who aren't in publishing, and I, I, I don't know, the New York Times uses it, um, but I always, you know, if I ask somebody at the bookstore, um, you know, do you want the trade paperback or the mass market? They're like, what? What are you talking about? So, thanks. Thank sure. Lynn? Yes? So, I, so I just finished the Bridgerton series, and I know oh, Bridgerton. on, on yeah. the Times, to, you know, they're like three Bridgerton novels on yeah. the Times bestseller list. Yeah. So my question is based on your Amanda Gorman observation that it's taking all this time to get it out by September. Do you think they were already like preparing the Bridgerton books before the launch of the series because they knew it, it would explode in popularity? Like, why are there so many Bridgerton books ready to sell when this series really just launched? 
Well, Chris, I can do a little research into the timing of the books, but usually the way it happens is the book comes out first and then it's licensed for film rights. So it was already out there when Netflix bought it. Probably, that's usually how it happens. Got it. And these days, um, literary agents are getting a little savvier about selling the film, the film rights quicker, or maybe sometimes selling the film rights first because then that'll get a publisher interested. But the traditional way of doing it is that way. And then what happens sometimes is you know, something like Bridgerton will come out and be unexpectedly popular and then the publisher will run out of books. Got it, okay. Which is what's been happening. How did the book compare to the movie? To the series, the TV? I'm not you never saw the, you didn't see the TV? I only saw the, the series. I, I, I wouldn't even think about reading the book. Oh, okay, I thought you did read the book. Nope. Yeah, has anyone read them? Has anyone read anything that, or is anyone reading anything this week that they want to recommend? I have a question about, I'm reading the children's Bible. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I mean, I was turned on to it by the New York Times book review. And I wondered, is that considered climate fiction? Yes, we're reading that in my hot off the press class. Chris, you should join the class. We're reading that next month and you're all welcome to join. And, um, it is definitely climate fiction. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, I finished, it reminds uh, me of Lord of the Flies. Yes, it's very Lord of the Flies. I finished The Mothers, um, which I, I really liked. I really liked The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. So then I read The Mothers. Um, the Mothers, Britt Bennett is, her book, The Vanishing Half has been on a lot of lists, the best of 2020, and she's getting a lot of acclaim. And that's a situation where um, it's her second book and it's, it's really good. And her first book was really good. Like, you know, sometimes, um, a writer will come out with a great first book and not be able to follow up. And it's nice to see that Britt Bennett is, um, consistently talented. The Mothers is a really good book. Yeah. So if you're reading, if you want to read Britt Bennett and you don't feel like springing for a hardcover, get The Mothers. Lynn, I just started A Burning. Yeah. It's I. It's an Indian. I. I don't know. Can't remember. I her forget name. her name. Yep, she's an Indian. First writer. book. First book. Also got lots of acclaim. Yeah. It sounds like a really a bit. A, it'll be disturbing, maybe. But it's supposed to. That's what it says on the back of the of the book. I just started it. I'm not into it yet. Yeah, it's. I think it's. I think it'll be a good read, but but tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're not afraid. Yeah. <laughs> Reading uh, Moonflower Murders. Oh, I heard this. Mystery really within a mystery. It is really good. It's really but, good. But is that Anthony Horowitz? Or? It is. And it's his second book. The first yeah. one was Magpie. Well, in this series anyway. The first was Magpie Murders. Oh, I yeah. read that. I also really recommend. Yeah. Um, that's this, a is, great this one is really good. That's Anthony Horowitz. Good. Well, the only other thing I was thinking was um, being so inspired by the inaugural poem, I was dragging out an idea I always had because, you know, in the old days, people used to have to do a lot of memorization and recitation of poetry. And um, I always thought it would be fun to get a group together and recite a poem, memorize and recite a poem. So if you wanna try that, let me know. We can do that separately. Okay, I, had I, to, I knew you'd be on board. I had to memorize the night before Christmas and the wreck of the Hesperus. Do you remember that in uh, in uh, grade school? Oh, I I memorized Silas Marner. Silas Marner. Wow. Well, if you'd like oh, to hear me recite, mm -hmm. the whole Silas book. Marner's a book. No, no. I, there was a poem. The know. Ancient Mariner. The Ancient Mariner. Sorry, the Ancient Mariner. Yeah. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, is that what yes. it's called? Yep. Like, that's what it was. Yeah. I had to memorize the prologue for the Canterbury Tales in Middle English. Ooh. I can still do it. Me too. Who that's said impressive. That? Irene, was I, that you? Yeah, I can still do it too, but only because I forgot it when I was in, I don't know, middle school. And now I've never forgotten it. Want to do it together? We could close with that. 
when Oprilin is Sura Suta, the Jute of March has pierced to the Ruta, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> yes. That one's ever sacred this way to breath and spirit have in every holding half. <laughs> the cup is in the youngest son that hath in his realm that hath a course see Rama. <laughs> and pretty oh. temperature with your garage is in a long invoke to go on on pilgrimages. Whoa. Right, yeah, yeah. Thank you for joining me. I oh, hope so. you're all you're all feeling lit. Yeah, thanks. Farewell. Thank See you, you next week. Okay. Take care. Uh, Have a good okay. week. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, will I be automatically on your, your same link? Same link. Yeah, I sent it to her. Oh, Lynn, she's my friend and I sent it to her. So okay. if, I'll if give you, you send Oh, do you know about my contest? Everybody, don't forget. I'll send you out an email. All right. Yeah, Sally, you can use the same link next week. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.